Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ez Tahoun. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Sipienta. I'm here with Aaron and Tom from the ICS Village. Please give us a quick intro. Yeah, uh, Aaron Crow. Uh, I'm the uh, I, I volunteer with with Tom at the ICS Village. Uh, came from critical infrastructure, about 25 plus years working in the, in the space, doing uh, OT stuff at power utilities and critical manufacturing, and a lot of a lot of cool fun places like that. Tom. And I'm Tom Van Norman, uh, one of the co-founders of the ICS Village. Been working with control systems for about three decades now. <laughs> That's super cool. I wonder what what happened. Why did you start the ICS Village? The uh, so we started the ICS Village uh, about 12, 13 years ago uh, at at another conference. They put out a, uh, a, a a a request for conferences, or I'm sorry, a request for villages. Uh, a couple of us in the industry we got together and said, "Hey, let's do this. Let's go and try to educate people and uh, you know try to upskill people and and help people better understand what." critical infrastructure and industrial control systems are. And then it just took off from there. That's super cool. Yeah. I wonder uh, how did you how did you see the trends shifting in ICS and IT, OT over your career and over your volunteering at the ICS Village? It, it's been a long time, right? So I, again, I'm very similar to Tom. I've been doing this for you know almost three decades. And um, you know it, it's been a, a difference in the market of used to, it was very much secure by obscurity. You know, it was, it was custom applications. And, and as we brought all this I'm going to say a word that most people don't like in the OT. It, it, we've converged with the IT side. We've brought all this IT technology in the space, and it's brought all those cyber concerns that we've been tackling in the IT space, but we haven't really conquered them in the OT space. So having access and identity and, and firewalls and all these things got brought into this thing, but we're still using 20, 30-year-old technologies. We still have Windows XP running in critical systems. We're not, you know, open encryption. Like, there is no encryption, open protocols on, on a lot of these things. So we have all these problems, but we care, again, the CIA triad is upside down as well. We care more about availability than we do confi confidentiality. So it's just different problems. It's the same problems, but we respond and remediate and, and handle them differently, and the use cases are a little bit different than they are in the IT space. 100%, how do you weigh in? Yeah, I do. so Aaron nailed it completely, and uh, you know, one of the things that I'll stress there is, uh, when we talk about control systems, and especially critical infrastructure, the biggest thing is availability, yep. right? So uh, you need that pump to running, that valves to work, you need that electricity to flow through those, those power lines. Uh, so when we talk about IT security, uh, we're not talking about health, life, and, and safety. Right. In control systems, we are. Yeah. Right? People can die, you can pollute the environment, you can do some really horrible things and be, have, have a very bad day, much like uh, you know, you, your, your power goes out or your water stops flowing. So uh, it is a lot of the same uh, problems that you see in enterprise, but they're just different because of the health, life, and safety. I wonder if uh, what we hear about all the time about the ITOT fusion, <laughs> like, is that is that happening in the... In the next few years? Yeah, I, I, I've, I've been, like I said before, I've been doing this for about three decades. We've been talking about that for three decades. <laughs> so, I know. It, I mean, I, I would say to add into that, I, obviously, I think we, we're, we're further along than we were 10, 15 years ago. Um, we're, we're doing more, you know, we have more advanced IT te technologies. We've got layer seven firewalls and application aware things, and, you know, we're doing endpoint protection and, and, and monitoring of the network and things like that. So, we're doing similar things but we're still separate, right? We're, we, we have these environments, and there's, a, there's usually a reason behind that is I don't want to have one you know, ability to some one person be able to hit a button and impact the entire environment. You know, if, I, if I push a patch and I have to reboot systems uh, at, at, on a Friday, there's an outage at IT, there's not on the OT side. They, they don't have an outage window on Friday night, so you want your power to work 24 seven, right? Ideally. You don't, you don't get a, a maintenance window on Friday night to, right. to do your patches. So it's just different how, how I do it. So knowing those differences doesn't mean we are against each other. And that's the thing I think we've got to change is the OT and IT, even though we, we do things a little bit differently, we're on the same team. Like we need to remember that, that we're on the same team. We're not, we're not at, you know, we're not against each other. We're on the same team when we're trying to protect the same types of stuff. We just do it a different way. It, it, you know, Aaron, Aaron, just to piggyback on that, you know, when you talk about a, uh, uh, downtime and things like that. OT has downtime, except sure. it's, you know, every year, every other year. Yeah, you know, there's maintenance turnarounds, there's other things, there's upgrade schedules and, and uh, things like that. But we just can't go and replace that computer with the newest operating system. There's right. a lot of engineering that goes behind that. There's a lot of applications that need to be updated. And it, it could cost millions and millions of dollars to do that. Plus you need that production downtime to do that. And that production downtime might only be every other year literally every other year for a week or two right. window. 
So does it boil down to not having uh, the same knowledge in these two teams, like IT and OT? Like they, they have different knowledge, they have different investigations, they have different mindsets for making decisions, they have different update schedules, they have different CIA triads, it's, alignments. It's not necessarily a knowledge, it is knowledge, so I'll put it this way. When my OT people, when, I, when I'm representing cybersecurity in an OT space, I have to know a lot of the same things that the IT people do. So firewalling and routing and networking and, and all that type of stuff. But I also have to know the, the operational side of the business, right? I have to understand if I make this change or I reboot this system, what is the downward impact of that, right? right. So, and it's not the same, again, going back to IT, maybe it reboot, you know, you lose your email for a few hours, you know, your web server goes down. Like, we're not talking about losing people's lives. If I do that in a power plant or a prime example, um, you, you flow, I assume you flew here on an airplane. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, there's, there's control systems in airplanes. Right. Do you want them to patch it while you're in the air flying from wherever Hopefully you... Hopefully not. <laughs> exactly, <I'm like> <laughs> right? And that's the difference, right? In IT, you patch on the fly because, right. again, worst case scenario, you have to reboot your laptop, right? right. You, don't, you're, you're, you don't lose jobs. You don't lose life. But when you're in an airplane at 30,000 feet, you don't, like, let's just wait until they land the plane. Then we'll do the update, right? That's, that's the biggest difference in an IT and an OT conversation is the, the potential impact uh, of those changes and, uh, you know, the implications of doing something wrong and having to reboot something on the fly. Yeah, the, the, uh, one didn't keep in mind with, it, with uh, ICS or, or OT, a lot of people, uh, you know, will, will come to our sandbox and ask, you know, what, what is this? The simplest thing is, uh, you know, we take the physical world, we take your, 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 your switches, your pumps, your valves, your lights, and all that stuff, 100%. put them into a, uh, an embedded system, and that's where, you, that's where you're becoming, uh, that's where your control happens. That's where you're starting to blend more with that IT side. Yeah. And, and the higher, you, or the further you get away from that embedded controller, the more of the IT systems you get into. You know, you get into your... Uh, your, 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 your Windows-based systems, you get into your, your networks, uh, things like that. But it all starts with bringing up the pumps, valves, and switches into that embedded system. And further away from you get from that, the more relatable to IT you're going right. to get. Yep. So as technologists, do you see the technology being the issue? Or is it a people process issue? Like, what, why do we not have the IT OT fusion if they've been talking about it for 30 years? <laughs> It, you know, the, the, it, when, when we talk about the, those embedded systems, they are different. They're on plant floors. They, they run 24-7, 365. They, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're in dirty, dusty environments. They could be 300 miles away from where we are right now, and that data is coming over a satellite connection or a radio connection. You might need a helicopter to get there. You might need a truck to get there. You might need some other way to get there. Right. Where your IT folks, yes, you have a remote office in, you know, another city, but is uh, that like a technology limitation for fusing that rugged machine elsewhere? Usually, with it, my app? it's usually not a technology. It's not that you can't. It's more the people and process side of that of why you don't, right? Um, so, like when I when I would support power plants, my office was in Dallas, okay, right. and we had power plants all over the state of Texas, right? So they'd be up to six plus hours away. Right. So my team, I would always tell them, you're not going to push a patch to a site when you're in Dallas. If you're going to do that, you're going to be at that plant. Because if I have to fix, if it goes down, you need to be I able to respond and fix it yep. instantly. Immediately, right? Yeah. So, which is different from IT. IT, I'm going to reboot it remotely, and then I'm, I'm just going to call the user, down. hey, you might have to reboot your machine. But that, that doesn't work in a power plant. Again, because same thing. Do you want to be in an airplane when they reboot it remotely, and it, it crashes and the system doesn't come back up? Like, there's, there's huge implications. Of this. So, there is a technology thing. So, some of the, the OT technologies are a little older, or, and they have different, you know, issues. We're using Windows XP. We're using things like that in these critical infrastructures. We're not going to replace them. Right. And there's a whole bunch of reasons behind that. But the bigger thing is, is some of the tech stack is very similar, but I still respond and I handle it differently. If I find a... A vulnerability. I, I've done an assessment in a, at a site that had, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever heard of Stuxnet? Yes. Okay. That, that had I Stuxnet suppose. actively on the environment, oh, but okay. it was not a Siemens environment. So there was nothing that Stuxnet was going to do, but it was there. So we left it because they were too worried about cleaning it because there was no outage. They're like, okay, we found it in the next outage. We'll clean it out. But for now, there's leave it there. just leave it there because it's not hurting anything. Right. You would never do that in an IT environment, right? You would kick it off, you would wipe the machine, all the things. But because it, because of the, the risk profile, when we did it and we, and we looked at the risk and, and the likelihood, we're like, it's not going to do anything, right? There's, there's no Siemens environment here, so it can't hurt anything. Got it. <laughs>
If we would shift gears into maybe the newest trend, I know every every decade there's a new trend in technology. Maybe the newest trend nowadays is AI. It's hard to miss AI. if you're an RSA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. My coffee was made by an AI today. <laughs> My taxi cab driver was an AI, yep, everything yep. was an AI. How do you see that affecting things when it comes to ICS? The, uh, it, it, it's certainly going to uh, augment the workforce, right? ICS or, or OT has a workforce issue like a lot of other tech workforces. Uh, it's certainly going to augment that workforce. It's going to absolutely add, add value to it, whether it's a network monitoring or your remote solution or your remote viewing solutions. Uh, AI has a place place in that. Over in our sandbox, we have an AI vendor uh, right now that that's demoing their, their product on a, on essentially a tack pass on how to pen test a digital twin. Correct. So it's going to uh, be a fort, force multiplier without that person. Right. You're gonna you're gonna clone Aaron and I, and you're gonna go and do what we do many times faster and probably better. And then Super on the flip side of that, it's the bad actors, right? It's the nation states, it's the, the script kiddies of, of the past being able to use IT or these AI capabilities to understand. So again, Tom and I have been doing this for 30 years, so we understand the OT systems and the environments very well, but new, new folks may not have that experience, but with AI and knowing all of that, they'll be able to say, hey, there's a Rockwell system or a Siemens system, How could, what, are, what are known vulnerabilities and what are my attack path opportunities to go into these spaces without having to buy the, because used to the way was you would buy the technology on eBay or find it used, you'd set up a lab, you'd do penetration testing, you try to figure those things out. Right. So it, there, was a, there was an overhead to getting those things, but with AI knowing all of those vulnerabilities, they can use that to say, okay, this is my environment. These are the things that I know that they have. How can I get in? So those are those are the the flip, you know, both sides of the coin of the good and and the the scary. Um, on my podcast, I have a protected all podcast, and and that's one of the last questions I asked every guest is, right. what's in the next five to ten years? What's one thing that you see coming up with Horizon that's that's exciting, and maybe one thing that's concerning? A lot of people are saying the same thing on AI for both sides of the coin for that that exact reason. Right? Just scaling the script kiddies. Yeah, yeah. All the script kiddies will be able to do a lot more yeah. with a lot less. A lot more effective, right? That's super cool. <laughs> on on the education side and on the community development side, do you think AI can help maybe portray your messages or portray your mentorship in a better way? It, the, the, it, it can certainly, I guess it can help and hurt, right? But we, the uh, we're starting to use AI for for our our training cu curriculum, you know, for researching, putting our curriculum together, and uh, just finding out what to put into the training. We're using AI all the time. I know Aaron has a, a lot more experience with using AI. Yeah. And, yes. Uh, we we so I, I work for a, a consulting firm. And we use AI for doing like tabletop exercises. So we have a custom AI that we use uh, through ThreatGen um, and we're doing tabletops and we, you can actually feed it data. Um, and then so you can feed it your asset inventory, your, your instant response plan, things like that. So when you're doing the tabletop, the tabletops of old, they're static. They, they're, they're usually only the executives are doing it. You don't get a lot of benefit from it. Whereas when you use it with an AI, it can, it can adjust on the fly. So a lot of times you go into a tabletop and it, you know, step 12 will be, and somebody will be like, yeah, that, that doesn't work in our environment because like, we have this other mitigation. Right. So then you're just like, oh, well, skip it. We'll go to the next question. But with the AI, you can adjust it and start over from there. The other side of that is you can, you can, make, you can gamify it. So you make it more like a fire drill of, I can run this once a week. I can make it a team building exercise. I can score it and say, hey, last week we got a, a five. This week I got a five and a half. So, so we got better, right? I, I didn't make the same mistake twice. And I, you can you, that repetition, just like anything, you get better and better and better. And these AI tools are helping us do this thing. So he mentioned the, the free notes with the, with the, um, the AI engines that they're doing and, and digital twin. There's, so there's a lot of cool things that like that, like that, that we can do. We just have to... What scares me in, in OT is so many people, when they don't understand things, they're like, I don't want to do this. This is never going to happen in OT. Right. And, and I, I think that's the bad idea to have. It's, it's, we should be doing it more of how can we do it in a safe way, get the benefit, and reduce the risk of, of, the, of the technology as well. Do you think there's a limitation for AI? Like, do you think maybe when we talk about these scenarios where you're talking about like some sort of an investigation or something like that, is there a point where AI maybe cannot do a proper evaluation or reasoning in an OT environment. Yeah, for sure. I mean, AI can be obviously there's there's a lot of limitations in AI from a regulatory even reason. Um, you're probably not going to see AI controlling in an OT space anytime soon. 
I'm not going to say never because I can I can imagine in the future how it could be that way. Right. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I, I think having you know the whole Terminator thing. I think we're going to want a, a human in the machine for the for the most part during this process uh, until we get to a different place. Um, there's there's definitely limitations on that. The other side of that, again, I coming from from power utility. There's regulation around what kind of data I can put in the cloud and, and critical information. So if I'm going to use AI in these spaces, I'm going to have to do it locally, right? So I'm not going to just dump it into you know Chat GPT and dump my asset inventory and all that kind of stuff. Obviously, that'd be a, that'd be a problem, right? So you know those are going to be, and because of the complexity of the environments in OT and how many there are, that's going to be another thing that's going to slow it on the on the IT on the OT side versus the IT side. How do you weigh in on the whole AI doing some reasoning? Yeah, you know what? The uh, it's certainly not going away. I, yeah. I think it's going to be a force, a force multiplier for us. I think it's going to give us a tremendous amount of value. Uh, my concern right now, and for the immediate future, is the value of that. Right? M move away from the vaporware. Move away from the uh, the marketing stuff. <laughs> what what can it actually do? What is it doing? And what can it help me with? Uh, Right now, I, I just see a lot of uh, a lot of marketing stuff and not a whole lot of actionable things. What's going to be standing in two years at RSA? Like when we come back, like everybody has AI over there, but how many of those things will actually last and show yep. real value in two to three years? Right. Hundred <laughs> percent. In terms of uh, what you can do today with like maybe uh, some of the open tools, yeah. Like, were you able to see something that comes through the community and you're like, wow, this is a big use case, like? I know the reporting is a big part of ChatGPT. Like reporting's a big one. You know, again, as a consultant, we use that a lot. Um, uh, again, we use it differently than than some organizations may because we do all local models. But we'll take, you know, an assessment. I'm going to take asset inventory. I'm going to do walk downs of sites, things like that, and we can feed that into a, a an AI, you know, language model, and, and build it for specifically our use cases. And it, to your point before, it helps us do things faster. So used to here's a prime example. Um, I'm not great at creating PowerPoints. As a consultant, you create a lot of PowerPoints, right? 100%. I can talk to it, I can draw it on the whiteboard, I know what I want it to say, but actually creating the PowerPoint is not something I do great. So when I was with another consulting firm, they would actually have two junior people, they'd schedule a meeting with me, they would pull their phones out and they would record me, and I would draw on the whiteboard, and then they would take that dictation and create the content, and, and I would draw the pictures on the whiteboard, and they would turn that into a, a PowerPoint. Today, I can record into ChatGPT. I can I can then take that and dump it into tools like Gamma, uh, which is a, a PowerPoint creating type tool. And I can create, now is it perfect? No, but it gives me a starting place that then I can turn over to marketing and say, polish this up, clean this up. It gives them something that's a visual. It's it has all about the zero to one. Correct. That's why it scales the script kitty. Exactly, 100%, right? Any closing remarks, Tom, as we're closing? Now, you know, talking about AI is certainly not going anywhere. We, we all know that. Uh, you know, when we use it in uh, ICS or, or OT, uh, I think it has a lot longer uh, uh, development cycle to, to, to go because we do have that health, life, and safety factor to it. Yeah. I'm really interested to see what, what happens. You know, we're really uh, looking forward to see where that false multiplier actually ends up and, and what we can get out of it. 100%. I appreciate you, folks. Absolute delight. Thank yeah. you so much Absolutely. for the pleasure of coming here and no, spending thank some you. time with me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you guys. thank yeah. you. Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you, folks.